Okay, so in this video, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a look at the concept of stationary waves. So I'm going to start off by looking at what the definition of a stationary wave is and how one's made. And then in the middle part, I'm going to look at um, the experiment that you can do to investigate the variables that affect the fundamental frequency of a stationary wave. And I'm going to finish up by looking at a few applications of stationary waves, so a few different things that make use of stationary waves in order to function. So that's the idea, so let's get started. So this is where I left off last time, looking at the principle of superposition. So I'm just gonna quickly recap that because it's gonna be important in this video. So superposition just basically means when two waves meet, their amplitudes will add together. And you get these two conditions where um, if two maxima meet each other, obviously they'll make a bigger maximum. If two minima meet each other, they make a bigger minima. And the other thing is that you can actually sometimes get the waves cancelling out. So if one's at a maximum and one's at a minimum, they can cancel each other out to give, leave nothing, which is called destructive superposition. This property up here where they add together is called constructive superposition. So this is going to be important in this video, so and let's have a look why. So let's first define what we mean by a station wave. So in the last video I said progressive waves are a type of wave that transfers energy from one place to another. A stationary wave is a little bit different because it doesn't actually transfer energy at all. It's still oscillating, but it doesn't move energy between two locations. So to make a stationary wave, you need two progressive waves. And they the very specific criteria to make one. So the first is they have to be the same frequency. Why? It's so we can get a fixed phase difference. So essentially the points where they add together and the points where they cancel out stay in the same location. So the same frequency and or wavelength. The two progressive wave waves need to travel at the same speed. Why? Because they, they need to cancel out their energy transfer. So the wave speed is the distance the energy moves per unit of time. So you need the two waves to be sending equal amounts of energy at the same rate to cancel each other out. So they need to be at the same speed and they need to be in opposite directions again so they cancel each other out. And to get a really nice stationary wave, what you need is them to have a very similar, if not the same, amplitude. So the two progressive waves. Um, so that's the general idea. So let's take a look at what a stationary wave actually looks like. Okay, so what we've got here is what a stationary wave looks like. So we're going to oscillate it at one end, and then it's fixed at the other end. And this is called the fundamental mode of vibration, or the first harmonic. This here is called the second harmonic. So we can see it actually, how you can see a full wave along here now, whereas before we only saw half. This is the third harmonic. We can see uh, a wavelength and a half here. And if we, in this case again, this is the fourth harmonic. So what it's doing is oscillating at four times the fundamental frequency to make the fourth harmonic. Okay, so what's actually going on here? Well, what's happening is one end is fixed. So when we oscillated it, which was over here, that was being shaken up and down, that sends a wave along from left to right. Because it's fixed at this end, that wave is reflected off here and goes back. So because you reflect the same wave back on itself, we know the two progressive waves have the same frequency, the same wavelength, and the same speed. And if we assume that we're not really losing any energy in the reflection process, we know they're going to have a similar amplitude. Because as I said in the last video, amplitude and energy are essentially the same thing. Amplitude gives you an indication of energy. So if you have this condition, when these two waves meet and superpose on one another, they're going to form a stationary wave. And that's what's going on there. So what's making those different harmonics I was talking about? So the first one you saw looked like this. So at one moment in time, it was up here. The net, as it moved on, the whole wave came down so it was flat, and then the whole wave came down here. So essentially, you just saw half a wave all the time, but it was moving up and down. That's called the fundamental or the first harmonic. So because you only saw half a wave, that tells you that this distance here, the distance between the nodes, is half a wavelength. So that tells you it gives you a way of working out the frequency or wavelength of your stationary wave. The second harmonic is when you oscillate it at double the fundamental frequency. So if you shake it 
at twice the frequency, you will now get the second harmonic. So you can actually see a full wavelength along here. So that means L now is a whole wavelength, but you can see the distance between nodes, therefore, is still half a wavelength. So that's a useful property of stationary waves, which we're going to make use of later on in the experiment. So distance between nodes is half the wavelength. So this one you get if you oscillate at one end, at double the frequency, you get the third harmonic, you oscillate at three times the frequency, and then the fourth harmonic, you oscillate at four times the fundamental frequency. And now we can see we've actually got two complete waveforms forming there. So those are your different fundamentals. So those of you who play uh, instruments, essentially, um, these are what is being produced when you like, pluck a guitar string. So when you pluck a guitar string, you are essentially creating this one, but you actually create all of these other modes of vibration at the same time, and those put together give you the sound, which sounds pretty nice if you tuned your guitar correctly. And so that's what's going on there. Okay, so those are your harmonics. Let's move on to look at how we can investigate station wave and investigate things that change properties of the station wave. So in this practical, the easiest thing to investigate is essentially how the tension in your string affects the frequency you need to use to produce a standing wave. So usually what you're going to do is you use these fixed masses hung on the end as a way of changing the tension, and then you adjust the frequency of your vibration generator until you produce a, like a second or third harmonic is typically what you'd use in an experiment, getting the fundamentals quite tricky. Um, so what you do is for each mass that you hang on there, You'd adjust this until you find the frequency to make, I don't know, your second or third harmonic there. And using that, you can essentially investigate the relationship between the tension and the frequency of your the frequency of your vibration generator and this therefore the station wave. So that's kind of generally speaking what you'll investigate. And when you do the investigation, you'll essentially determine this equation here. So um, F in this equation is actually the fundamental frequency, and then the second harmonic is double that, or the third harmonic is triple that. So essentially, uh, you get the same relationship regardless of which mode you're looking at. Um, L is the distance between nodes, so that's this distance right here. T is the tension, so that's created by the weight force of the masses. And then this mu is something called mass per unit length. So essentially, it's a measure of how thick your string is. It's a bit more complicated than that because obviously if you change the material you change the different mass per unit length but thickness is a quite a good guide as to what that means. So this is the general experiment that you'll do and this is how you investigate it. So what you need is a method to measure what the frequency of vibration is so then you can look at the relationship and to do that you need an oscilloscope. So let's give you a brief idea of what's going on in an oscilloscope. So you start off with a filament over here, which when you pass a current through, gets really hot. And when it gets really hot, electrons gain enough kinetic energy to escape from the filament. So they're able to leave it, and this is called thermionic emission, because it's caused by heat, so thermion. Then you've got an anode, which is positively charged. So the electrons are all attracted this way through your oscilloscope. This is where you connect up your vibration generator to. So this is called, these are called the Y plates, and what they will happen is cause the electrons to reflect up or down. So if you think about it, you're supplying your uh, a vibration generator with an AC supply, because it's coming from the mains. So what's going to happen is when you're supplying it with this, the electron is going to be attracted upwards, essentially. When you supply it with this, the electron is going to be attracted downward. That's the general idea of how it works. You'll learn more about electric fields in year 13. So that's the Y plates, and that's where you connect up your vibration generator to. And then it goes through your X plates, which are connected to your time base circuit. These are what make the electrons deflect left and right on your screen, so you can see a waveform there. And you can essentially change the settings on these to stretch or compress it on on your screen, and we'll have a look at that now. The last part is a fluorescent screen, and you'll learn more about these in the quantum part of the course. So an electron collides with the fluorescent screen, that then 
causes excitation, and when it de-excites, you get a visible photon produced, which is why you can see where the electrons end up. So that's a very brief overview of like, what's going on inside your oscilloscope. Let's see what you're actually going to see when you use one. So yours will look something like this. So this is the fluorescent screen I was talking about, and this is the waveform that you can see on there, created by your X and Y plates and your electrons. So this is where you're, you connect your vibration generator to. So this is your connection to the Y plates. And what you're going to do is you're going to adjust things called the X gain and the Y gain. So Y gain stretches your waveform in the Y direction. So it either will stretch it out or compress it. X gain will stretch or compress it in the X direction like this. So what you would do is you'd adjust those until you can see one full waveform on your screen. So it makes maximum use of the screen there. Then what you do is you would measure the time period from this waveform. So you want the time for one full waveform, which is this one here. And what you do is you would count the number of squares or divisions you can see on here. So here it's about one, two, three, four divisions for one time period. So when you adjust your X gain, you will put it on a certain value. So it might be one millisecond per division, two milliseconds per division, that kind of thing. So if each division is one millisecond and there's four divisions for the time period, that means the time period of your vibration generator is four milliseconds. So if you do one over that, that gives you the frequency of your vibration generator. So that's how your oscilloscope works. And these are the key things to be using. Okay, so let's just quickly summarize that because uh, I did whiz through that fairly quickly. So the first thing you're going to do in terms of actually taking measurements is connect your vibration generator up to the Y plates of your oscilloscope. Then what you do is you adjust your X and the Y gain to pick values that make a waveform on your screen. You count the number of divisions in the X direction for one time period, multiply it by, by, by the X gain, or like the number of milliseconds per division to get the time period, flip that over and you get the frequency. So that's how you're going to measure your frequency of your vibration generator there to allow you to investigate the relationship to your variables. Okay, so now I'm going to talk a little bit about some applications of stationary waves and some features of stationary waves. Okay, so one application of stationary waves is a microwave. So in a microwave what you've got is a device over here that's emitting you may guess it, microwaves. And what happens is it sends microwaves across this way, they're reflected off this wall, and they come back. And so what we get is a stationary wave set up in your microwave. So your stationary wave has a few key features that you need to know about. So it has these parts here, which are called antinodes, or regions of maximum displacement. These, this is where your progressive waves met in phase. And if you want to know what that means, go back to my previous video on progressive waves where I talk about what the phase means. So here is where they meet in phase. So you have constructive superposition happening here. You get maximum displacement. This is called a node. This is where the two waves cancel each other out because they meet in antiphase. And that's why you get a region of zero displacement. And we have, you can see several nodes and antinodes here. So what we've got going on is regions where water molecules in your food, which the microwaves have been picked specifically for, because they go crazy with these microwaves, the water here is being vibrated a lot. So it's being given a lot of energy, gets really hot. Water here gets nothing, doesn't get vibrated at all, stays really cold. I don't know about you, but I don't like eating food that goes hot, cold, hot, cold, hot, cold. That's not great. So what you do is you have a turntable in your microwave which rotates um, the food around so it mixes where the hot and cold parts are and you get a nice cooked piece of food. Um, while we're looking at station here, wave here, I think it's worth thinking about what the water molecules are actually doing at a moment in time. So let's take this thick black line that we've got here. So on that thick black line, is where all the water molecules are at one moment in time. So they snap all along these positions on this one. 
Half a time period later, the water molecules all occupy these positions along the dotted line. Okay? But remember, our water molecules aren't moving across here. They're just moving up and down. So a water molecule that's here along this red line is being vibrated between these locations here. A water molecule that's maybe here is vibrating between these locations right here. And a water molecule that's here or here or here is not being vibrated at all. So what you find is that actually all of the water molecules between these two nodes are at their maximum displacement at the same time. So they're all in phase with each other. Same between these two nodes, they're all at their minimum position at the same time. So they're all in phase with each other. But if you cross over a node, what you'll notice is these are at a maximum, these are at a minimum. So when you cross a node, your phase difference becomes pi or 180 degrees because they've gone from being in phase to being anti-phase. Um, so when you do this with molecules in a stationary way, they're either in phase or in an anti-phase, uh, or they're not vibrating at nodes. There's no other possibilities there, which is different to a progressive way, and it's useful to know. So those are, uh, that's a microwave, and that's some of the features of your stationary wave. Let's have a look at a very interesting uh, application of stationary waves, which you might not have thought of. Um, that is atomic structure. So most of you will be familiar uh, with the planetary structure of the atom, as it's called, where we imagine there's a nucleus in the middle and the uh, electrons are orbiting it like planets around the sun. That's most people's image of an atom. But that's not quite right. So uh, especially those of you who do chemistry will know electrons are arranged in orbitals, which means in subshells they travel around in pairs, and electrons are like being in pairs. So in an orbital, what we've got is two electrons, one going one way around, one going the other, going at the same speed as each other, and so they have the same speed traveling in opposite directions. According to the de Broglie equation, wavelength is h over mv. So if they have the same mass and the same speed, that's going to give them the same wavelength. So we've got all the conditions we need to basically make a stationary wave. So that's what an, an, an orbital in, a, in an atom is. It's a stationary wave, and we have the different modes of vibration corresponding to the different orbitals, uh, which is quite a nice thing to have a look at. And just to give you some context here, what kind of speed are our electrons? About 2 times 10 to the 6, so pretty damn quick. Um, so that's the kind of... That's the speed, I think, in an inner shell in a hydrogen atom, for instance. So, very quick, and I just thought I'd throw that in there because it's interesting. Okay, so those are a couple of different applications of stationary waves. I hope you found this useful and uh, interesting. Um, if, you, if there's anything that's not clear or anything you'd like to ask, please do comment below and ask me. But as always, thank you very much for taking the time to watch.